Greetings, Matt Roscoe here at the University of Montana, a lecture on section 3.1 from our text, the derivative formulas for powers and polynomials in our course, Calculus for Middle School Teachers. Uh, we begin the third chapter um, of this text, which is largely a chapter about shortcuts to differentiation. It's where we develop the algebra of differentiation, which is the idea of, you know, are there algebraic rules that can take us from a function to its derivative without ever having to go to the graph. Uh, so that's what we'll be developing in the next couple of weeks, a set of rules to give us differentiation. You might think of it as a new algebra of differentiation. So let's get started today by looking first at the derivative of a constant. So what happens if we have a constant function? Uh, is there a generalization for powers? Uh, what about a constant multiple? And then some indifference. And then I'll do a series of examples. So the first one you should be aware of is that there is a rule for the derivative of a constant function, and it is this. If c is a constant, then the derivative with respect to x of c is equal to 0. So let's take a look and see if we can develop some in intuition about why this rule makes sense. And probably the best place to go for intuition is to look at graphs, because that's what we've looked at up until this point. So let's take the graph of a constant function. In this case, it's f of x equals 6 and take a look and, and talk a little bit about, oops, sorry, so we'll leave it at 6, and take a look at what happens if I put a point on that function and think about the change uh, of that function uh, with respect to x. So how much is the function's y value changing with respect to x? And if you think about that for just a couple of seconds, you, you will quickly come to the conclusion that the y value is not changing at all, that, that this function is horizontal, uh, is a horizontal line, and so it's never going to climb. There's never going to be a rise uh, for any value of run. And so that leads us to believe that, um, that the value of the slope of the function, there's the, the slope, the purple line would be a tangent to the function at that point, which of course doesn't change when I change uh, the, the point at which we're taking the tangent. Um, and so what is the value of the slope of the purple, uh, the purple tangent line? Uh, the value of the slope of the purple tangent line is zero everywhere. So what's the derivative of the function? Looks like the derivative of the function everywhere is valued at zero. And notice that that doesn't change if I make the constant a different constant. Uh, if I move uh, the, the function up or down, um, if the constant function is um, you know, y equals 7 or f of x equals 7, if the constant function is f of x equals negative 5, any time I have a function equal to a constant, then its derivative is 0, or the derivative graph is f of x equals 0. All right, so hopefully that makes the point. Um, it should make sense to you that if, if what we're trying to do is measure change, and what we're measuring here is a constant, uh, so, so there is no, uh, no change in a constant function, so the value of the derivative is zero everywhere. Let's take a look at the power rule. Here we're going to uh, um, develop a rule for any function x to the n where n is a real number. If we take the derivative, the derivative with respect to x of any function x raised to the n where n is a real number, then that derivative function is equal to n times x raised to the n minus 1. So our first sort of big rule that gives us something other than an intuitive zero, let's take a look and see if we can figure out why this makes sense. So if we go to the Desmos graph, let's take a look first at, at the good old x squared function, something we're probably fairly familiar with at this point, the parabola. Uh, if I take a point on the parabola and move it left and right and then think about its uh, um, tangent, and the slope, in particular, of the tangent to the function at any one of those points. And I can see that the tangent line starts negatively valued and then grows to a zero-valued tangent. Uh, and then the tangent slope increases to positive and beyond uh, positive, increasingly positive slope as I move to the right. So uh, putting a point that's valued at the slope of the purple line, we can see that the slope of the purple line is getting less and less. Well, let's start back here. It's growing uh, as we approach zero, negative and growing as we approach zero, and then positive and growing as we move beyond zero. And putting in the dotted line over the top of that, then it looks like um, the derivative function or the graph of all of those slopes at a point is actually a line. And now the question is, well, what line is it? So let me turn a few things off, and then we'll try to find the derivative 
function's equation. Well, we know it's a line passing through the origin, so it is y equals mx. So really all we need to do is pick the slope off this graph. I can see that if I go over 5, I go up 10. That's a nice point right there. So um, run of 5, rise of 10. So it looks like the derivative of this function is 2x. So I guess well, let's just um, compile some, um, some information here. So if we start out <coughs> with the function um, uh, of x squared, then the derivative function uh, of x squared appears to be 2x. Uh, let's continue to add to this by looking at um, a different derivative function. What if we move this up to 3? Um, so if we move it up to x uh, to the third, um, oh, I see what's going on. I was like, why can't I see it? If I move it up to x to the third, then if I put a point on that function, there it is playing back and forth. It's a little too fast for my liking, but here's the function. We can look at its tangent to the function at that point and think to ourselves, okay, it's positively valued, comes down, meets zero, and then it's positively valued again. Huh, interesting. So positive slope, uh, but decreasing to zero, and then again a positive slope and increasing. So interestingly here, you know, positive but decreasing to here, and then positive but increasing. So you should be thinking about first and second derivatives there. We'll put a, a point above that that actually shows us how that slope is changing. Well, there it is. It's positive but decreasing. It e equals zero at the origin, then it's positive and increasing as I go beyond there. So a graph of that looks like this, and it does appear that the derivative of the cubic function, the red function, is the purple function, which appears to be a parabola. So let's take a get stab at it. Is it y equals x squared? And of course, it is not so easy. Um, it's getting a little bit cluttered here, so I think what I'll do is turn off the original function. I'll turn off the point on that function and the, and the tangent line and ask ourselves, well, it does appear to be similarly shaped to the purple uh, derivative graph, this red guess, but it's certainly not the right one. So what we really need to do is perhaps investigate what would happen if we stretched that graph. So uh, if we stretch it, uh, what we're trying to do is match the red graph to the purple graph, and it matches up at k equals 3. So it looks like the derivative function, the purple graph, is indeed y equals 3x squared. Let's add that to our growing list. Um, so we, we started with x to the third. We're hunting these power functions. Um, and what did we get? We said it was 3x squared. Uh, let's go to x to the fourth and see if we can get some intuition. And so we'll go back to the top here. We'll get rid of these two guesses because it would certainly be different for x to the fourth. Um, here is x to the fourth and a point on x to the fourth. And we could play it back and forth. Let's slow that down a little bit and put a tangent line on there and watch how that tangent line changes. Um, maybe we could speed it up a little bit. So the tangent line now to the function, I can see it's positively valued, zero, negatively valued. So in an increasing sense, it starts very steeply negatively valued and then grows to zero and then grows quickly to be very positively, steeply positively valued. So if we put a point in here that indicates the actual value of those slopes, then those would be negative in this uh, to the left of the origin growing, 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 and then equal to zero and positive to the right of the origin. So the graph of that, um, the, the derivative, the, those slopes uh, looks something like that. And maybe I'll pause it right there. So if we know what that graph looks like, the question is, is well, what is that particular graph, the derivative of that function? And we've just seen something that looked like this. It looks an awful lot like a cubic function. But it's not that cubic function, so we'll put a k in front of it and uh, adjust a slider and ask ourselves, well, which, which k makes sense? And it appears that the k equal to about 4 works nicely here. So let's add that to our list. Um, we've got something 4x squared, uh, excuse me, x to the third. 
So the big question would be, I'm starting to see the pattern here, is x to the fifth derivative really 5x to the fourth? And let's just check it. Um, let's put in the derivative, make this one a 5. We'll go ahead and graph it. We'll get rid of a few of these pieces. So we now have the graph of x to the fifth looks a lot like x to the third. Um, we'll put a point on that function and think about its slope of its tangent line. And it does appear to be positively valued, but decreasing to zero and positively valued and increasing to infinity. So something like that, all positive, but decreasing to zero and then returning up to infinity. Let's go ahead and put in the value of that slope at every point. Yep, it's positively valued, decreasing to zero, positively valued, increasing to infinity. So its function looks like that. And the question is, is that function really equal to what we think it is? We thought that generalizing the rule, we seem to be seeing that this would be equal to what? 5 uh, times x raised to the fourth. And sure enough, it is. I should probably make it a different color. Oh, let's make it green. And so we're done. I can see that there's the dotted purple function, which is the value of the derivative of f of x. And here is the green function overlaid on top, which seems to fit it quite well, 5x to the fourth. OK, so let's see if we can generalize what we have here. In general, what appears to be happening is, is we're taking 1 away from the exponent. If we think of that like a 1, the 2 went to 1, the 3 went to 2, the 4 went to 3, the 5 went to 4. So if we were to generalize this rule based on the limited examples we have, we'd say that this is x to the n. And what we do is we take the n out in front, so the n here, and we multiply by x raised to the one less power of n, so n minus 1. And that indeed is the rule that um, we have displayed on the, on the slide previously. So let's go ahead and go back and take a look at that, <coughs> that rule. So now you have a, a really nice rule that actually works for any value of n. I want to make sure you're aware that this can be any real number. The examples I gave you, of course, were integers, but uh, you could have, for example, a fractional power or an irrational power like the root of 2, um, any power of n, or a negative power um, um, with uh, uh, any real number. This will work. Now, there are some places um, we'll talk a little bit later that, uh, that this is, uh, gives some interesting results. Uh, so any real number, you, this power rule holds. So let's take a look at a constant in front of a function. And what we see here is that the derivative of a constant in front of a function, if f is differentiable, um, will yield the constant times the derivative of the function itself, or c times f prime of x. So what does this mean? I mean, literally, what it means is you can take a constant and put it out in front of, of a function and, and then go ahead and differentiate the function itself. Um, and, and leaving the constant multiple out in front. So let's take a look at how, how we might get a little bit of intuition about this. I've made a constant multiple um, worksheet in Desmos. And if we let the constant, um, well, if we, if we take a look at, at, at what, um, uh, what we just did take a look at, which is, is the x squared function, then we, we expect that its der derivative would be this line which we know to be 2x now using the power rule. Um, but let's take a look and see, well, what happens if I put a constant out in front of it other than 1? What if I put a constant equal to 2 out in front of it? Well, then what is my derivative function? Well, the derivative function then is still a line. But notice that, that it's different than the one for a constant multiple of 1. It's a line of steeper slope. Um, uh, and in fact, you, you notice that what's going on here is that w we're dilating or, or, or um, 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 stretching the function and its derivative at the same time. So that's kind of an interesting result. But we could quickly develop a little bit of intuition here and see um, what we get. So let's, uh, let's talk about the function and its derivative and ge generate a, a list, a table of examples if the function is 2x squared, what is the derivative function is the question, right? 
So here I have the function 2x squared. Well, the derivative function is the purple function, and it goes through the origin, and it, it has slope over 1 up 4, it looks like, because that value is 4. So over 1 up 4. Um, so I would assume then that we have something like 4x as our derivative function. Let's take a look and see what happens if we make this constant multiple 3. Well, same thing happens. We get um, a steeper parabola and also a steeper derivative. Um, and if we go over 1, we go up 6. So the derivative looks like it's equal to 6x. So we had 3x squared equal to 6x for its derivative. Um, let's take a look at one more. What if I made this 4? Well, again, a linear function stretching both the function and its derivative over 1 up 8, it looks like. So where are we at on our picture? It looks like if we had 4 as our constant multiplier of x squared, we get 8x. And the question would be, well, is 5x squared then equal to 10x? I believe it is. But let's take a look. 5x squared, sure enough, over 1 up 10. So the derivative is equal to 10x. And <clears throat> so it seems to be generalizing that if I have, um, um, if I take a look at this and think about this as 2 times 2x, and this as 3 times 2x, and this as uh, 4 times 2x, and this has 5 times 2x, then I could see that the way I can think about a function and its derivative when a constant multiplier is involved um, is, is to simply take the constant multiplier out in front and then take the derivative of the function who's being, that's being multiplied. So you should notice that, um, that x squared's derivative is 2x in each of these cases um, based on the power rule we just saw and the constant multiplier can be taken out of in front. So in um, a general sense, um, if our function is some constant times a function, then our derivative is going to be some constant times the function's derivative. Um, and this should sort of make sense to you, right? I mean, in the sense of measuring change, all the change in these functions is coming about because of the x squared. That's the engine that's changing. This thing out in front is not changing as x changes. So the, 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 the way that change is occurring is really dependent on x, not on 5. So the, the constant multiplier should be thought as something that can just simply um, takes a change and amplifies, or, or if it's smaller than 1 multiplier, reduces the change uh, due to the function. So it's, it comes out in front as a multiplier. Um, so one last uh, rule, I think I have one last rule, and that's the sum and difference rule. Um, if f and g are both differentiable uh, functions, then what happens if you add or subtract them is the question here. So if I take the derivative with respect to x of the sum or the difference of two functions, then that's equal to the derivative with respect to, of, to, respect to x of the first function, uh, plus or minus the derivative with respect to x of the second function. In a sense, you can kind of think of the differential operator as distributable across a sum or a difference of two functions. And this one's a little bit harder to get a, an intuitive handle on, but let's see if um, the, the technique that the book uses might give us uh, some help. So what if we were to just inspect some data for two functions, f of x and g of x, uh, and then to inspect what happens when I add the two functions together. So in the first column, we have x. In the second column, f of x value. Third column, g of x's value. In the fourth column, the function x and the function g, excuse me, the function f of x and the function g of x added together. So let's step out here for a second and back to, um, sorry, not that one. Back to this and take a look at what happens when these two things are added. So I've got this worked out on paper. Um, let's just kind of think about how we could estimate what f prime of x would be, what g prime of x would be, and what the derivative of this sum of two functions would be. So I'll call it d by dx of f of x 
plus g of x. So in this first uh, spot, we really don't have any way of estimating because there's no values given before, but in the, in the second after x from 0 to 1, we could, we could estimate what's happening at 1 by looking at the interval prior to it. You can see that f of x is increasing by 10, x is increasing by 1, so f prime of x here would be 10, here it would be 20, here it would be 30, and here it would be 40, so increasing by 10, 30, and 40. Um, g prime of x um, increases by 0 0.2 in this first unit interval, um, and then 0 0.2 again, and then 0 0.2 again, and then 0 0.2 again. And let's see what the, the combined function increases by. Well, here it's increased by 10.2. Here it's increased by 20.4. Oh no, 20.2, sorry. And here it's increased by 30.2. And here it's increased by uh, 40.2. Each one for a unit uh, increase in x. And what you should notice is that, you know, if I was to take the derivative of a sum of two functions, I would get these values, which is same as just adding these two derivative values. So this numerical example at least seems to give us some good intuition that any time I have a sum or difference of functions, I can simply add or take away uh, either sum or, or take the difference of the two functions' derivative values. Um, I hope that that gives you some intuition. Now I should say that all of these, um, these um, I guess, proofs that I've just presented are really intuitive proofs. They're ones that are based on a limited number of examples and that if we wanted more definitive proof, we'd have to go into this, a study of limits. And, and uh, if you want to take a look at how the limit um, derivations for all of these rules works, your book does have a section on that at the end of chapter three. Well, let's take a look at some examples then. Sorry. Um, I'll try to do this in a split screen form. I'll put this up. And, uh, and we'll take a look at how this might work split screen. Okay, we'll try it. Well, let's see. What if we were trying to differentiate the function f of x is equal to, uh, well, I don't need to write it. Let's just go ahead and think about it. Um, what if I was trying to find the derivative with respect to x of f of f of x, um, which is e must be equal to the derivative with respect to x of what f of x is equal to. Oops. So that would be uh, 23 minus 4 thirds x. Okay, well the first thing I notice is that um, I have a difference of two functions, so I can take, I'm going to move this to right here, I can take the derivative with respect to x of 23 and subtract the derivative with respect to x of 4 thirds x. So that's the sum and difference rule I just used. Um, anytime I take a derivative of a sum or difference of functions, uh, you can distribute the differential operator across that sum or difference. Now, um, in this next step, I'm going to say this guy is zero. Um, that's because I have a constant function and the derivative of any constant is zero. Um, so that's the justification for that step. Um, in the next step, I'm going to go ahead and pull out the four thirds. So I'd have zero minus four thirds, also a negative four thirds d by dx of just x. So the reason for that is because that's a constant multiplier and it's attached to a function, so I can take any constant multiplier out in front of the differential operator. And then the last one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about this function as an x to the 1, and so I can use the power rule. So negative 4 thirds, um, let's see, uh, times 1 times x to the 1 minus 1. So we're, we're applying the power rule. I'm taking the exponent, putting it out in front, and then subtracting 1 from the exponent. So that's the, the power rule. And what we end up with here is we get negative 4 thirds uh, times 1 times x to the 0. And we know that anything to the 0 power is equal to 1. 
and so the answer here is negative four thirds. And this shouldn't come to, uh, to you as any big surprise, right? The original function that's given is a linear function, and so its slope everywhere is given by the, uh, the value of the slope that's found in the linear function, negative four thirds. So let's take a look at a different one. Well, here we have something a little bit more to do. Um, we'll take the derivative of the function um, 2x squared plus x minus 15. So let's start with this. So what's the derivative with respect to x of f of x? Well, that's got to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of, what is it, 2x squared um, plus x minus 15. So the first thing I notice is that I have a sum and a difference here. So applying the sum and difference rule twice, um, I could take the derivative with respect to x of 2x squared plus the derivative with respect to x of x minus um, the derivative with respect to x of 15. A quick um, application of the constant rule, well, the derivative of any constant is going to be 0. So that one can go away. And we would have in this step the derivative with respect to x of 2x squared plus the derivative with respect to x of x. Now we have um, a constant multiplier on this first term. It can come out in front of the differential operator. 2 times the derivative with respect to x of x squared plus the derivative with respect to x of x. And now we have, adding in a little bit of information, two power functions, so each one can be um, derived using the power rule. So we would have 2 times the 2 comes out in front of the x, the x to the mi 2 minus 1 power, uh, plus 1 times the x to the 1 minus 1 power. And what do we get? We get 4x to the first. Um, 1 times anything to the 0 is, well, that's a 1. So plus 1. So it turns out that the derivative of this quadratic function turns out to be a linear function, what we would have expected having looked at some quadratic functions earlier in the lecture. And this, of course, could be checked graphically using our Desmos dif differentiation. Um, well, why don't we do it really quick? It might be kind of fun to try. Um, so I'll go to my Desmos screen. And um, you, know, you have before seen me use the Oh, I need to sign in. Sorry. Okay, I'm signed in now. So my save graphs are, are available. So if I open the derivative function graph that I showed you in an earlier lecture, and if you want to um, um, see where that graph is located, here is um, a link. I'll just show that really quick. And um, what we'll do is we'll take a look at what was the function we had? 2x squared plus x minus 15. So 2x squared plus x minus 15. There it is. And we can see that its tangent function looks like, or tangent to the graph looks like that. I can move that tangent along the graph and expect um, the derivative function right here. And moving that tangent along the graph, I can see that it's something like that. And the question is, is that graph really equal to um, 4x, what was it, plus 1? Yeah, it does appear to overlay um, the dotted line, which is the derivative. So that's nice. I'll go ahead and not save that. All right. And go back here to our next example. Well, what if I was given something like this? The function um, g of z, and it's equal to, let's see, z plus 3 times 2z minus 5. One thing I want to point out is that we have a, a two functions here being multiplied. Now, we know that differential operator can be distributed across sums and differences, but we don't really know what to do with uh, multiplication and division yet, and those rules will be coming. 
But for now, probably the best thing to do here would be to rewrite this function. We know that when you multiply two linear functions together, you get a quadratic. And we just did a quadratic, so let's go ahead and rewrite it. So if I take z times 2z, I get 2z squared. I take z times minus 5, I get minus 5z. I take 3 times 2z, I get 6z. And 3 times minus 5, I get minus 15. So it's 2z squared um, plus... Uh, just a z minus a 15, so something really similar to what we saw in the last example. So maybe I'll move through it a little bit faster and say that uh, g uh, prime of z is going to be the derivative of this first term. Now it's got a constant multiple that comes out in front, and the derivative of z squared is going to be 2z. Um, and then the next thing I'll do is derive um, the derivative with respect um, to z of z itself. Well, it's a z to the first, so 1 comes out in front, and we reduce the power by 1, so it's z to the 0. So it would be plus a 1, and then the derivative of the constant minus 15 is indeed just a 0. So um, g prime of z, the derivative of g with respect to z, is 4 z plus a 1, and um, hopefully you notice that that's remarkably similar to the last problem, just written in a different form. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that, well, we know what to do with sums and differences. So when you can get into a sum and difference form, you're going to be able to apply the rules that we have at this point. So what about this one? So what if we got something like this? Again, it appears like something we wouldn't know how to deal with. We have s of h equal to negative 12 over the square root of h. Okay, so something like that. So if we could rewrite this as uh, um, something we know how to deal with, then we'd be in better shape. And right away, I see that s of h could be rewritten as negative 12 over, well, the, the, the square root can also be written as the 1 half power. So if we write that as uh, h to the 1 half power, um, uh, we're in a little better shape. But again, we have two, a constant function and an h to the 1 half function written as, as a quotient. We don't have a quotient rule yet. But we could rewrite this as uh, uh, by putting it up top by, by writing it as a negative exponent. So s of h could be written as a negative 12 h to the negative 1 half. And now I can see that I can certainly deal with this. I have a constant times a power function. So um, um, let's go ahead and differentiate it. Um, s prime of h is going to be take the constant out in front, constant multiple rule times the derivative of this power uh, function. So what would that be? Take the 1 half out in front, uh, negative 1 half out in front, and then multiply by h to the negative 1 half minus 1. So take the old power and subtract 1. And what do we get for a derivative function? Um, s prime of h is going to be negative times negative is positive, so 6. And then h to the negative 1 half minus 1 more, so it would be h to the negative uh, three halves. Okay, so that's one way that you could write the derivative in this case. Well, what about if you have um, generic constants out in front? Um, so something like this. If we have a uh, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, how do I find the derivative? Um, we're going to say that a, b, and c are constants, so this is sort of like parameters in a generic quadratic function. Uh, what would be the derivative? So let's talk about that. So we could find dy dx by first taking the derivative of this first term. a is a constant, so it comes out in front, and we would multiply by the derivative of x squared, which we've seen already is 2x. Uh, so taking the 2 out in front and subtracting 1 from the exponent. Um, b is a constant, it would come out in front, and then we take the derivative of x. Um, x can be thought of as x to the first, um, so we take the 1 out in front, reduce the power of x um, by 1, so to the 0, and it turns out that that will just be x to the 0, so 1 times x to the 0. And then c is a constant, so c's derivative uh, with respect to x is 0. So what does that mean? That means that 
uh, dy dx, in this case, the derivative of any generic um, quadratic function is 2ax plus a b. And that's a pretty interesting uh, result, uh, one that might be familiar to some of you who've ever looked at the line of symmetry of a quadratic. Uh, if you solve this for 0, um, it will tell you where that line of symmetry is equal, because that's where the derivative is equal to 0 at that vertex of the parabola. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a little off the screen there. I hope you can uh, follow me on that. Um, here's kind of an amazing example, in my opinion, of the, the, the insight that you gain from differentiation. Um, take a look at um, the area of a circle. Well, we know the area of a circle really is a function of its radius. It's, it's pi times r squared, right? And the question is, is what, what is dA dr? So what if I take the derivative of area with respect to r? Well, pi is a, a constant, so it comes out in front and we take the derivative with respect to r of r squared, um, which is the same thing as pi times, let's see, 2r to the 2 minus 1. So what is that? That's applying the power rule. It's pi times uh, 2r to the first, or just 2r, and written a little bit more um, compactly, or I guess maybe recognizably, you get 2 pi r, which is, the circumference. So this is a really interesting idea. The, the, the rate of change with respect to r of the area is actually equal to the circumference. And hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you when you think about you know, a circle with, with a, an r. If you, um, if you increase the area of the circle, um, how fast is it increasing? Well, it turns out it's increasing uh, excuse me, if you increase the radius of the circle, how fast is the area increasing? Well, the, the area will increase, um, you know, this little tiny amount if you if you bump the radius, right? If you, if you make the radius just a little bit bigger, then you'll add that red area to the circle. And what is that red area's uh, rate of change? Well, nothing more than just the circumference of the circle. So I think that that's a really intuitive, neat um, der der derivative result that we can see right away that the the rate of change of area with respect to r is equal to the circumference at that radius. Well, let's do one applied problem and then we'll quit. Uh, so what if we have something like this, a uh, quantity in tons of material in a municipal weight site is a function of the number of years t since 2000. So our quantity as a function of t is going to be equal to 3t squared plus 100. Um, we're supposed to find q of 16 and q prime of 16, and um, and then the ratio of those two. So what's uh, q of 16? Well, that's just evaluating this function at 16. Easy enough, right? Uh, 3 times uh, 16 squared plus 100. So 868. Um, let's talk about... Um, uh, well, let's go ahead and find them all. What would be q prime of 16? Well, we first need to find q prime of t. So let's think about how we'd find q prime of t. We'd apply the differential operator to this side. Um, so it would be the deriv derivative with respect to t of 3t squared plus 100, which is the same as the derivative with respect to t of 3t squared plus the derivative with respect to t of 100. Okay, that's a constant multiplier. Well, I'm using the sum rule right there. Constant multiplier rule would say 3 times the derivative with respect to t of t squared plus the derivative with respect to, to t of 100. Well, that's just 0 because this is a constant function. So applying the constant rule, we have 3 times the derivative with respect to t of t squared. This is a power rule, so we'll go ahead and apply the power um, differential rule for d derivative rule for powers, and we'll get 3 times 2t to the 2 minus 1, which is 3 times 2t, which is just 6t. Okay, so our derivative with respect to t is 6t. You need another one of these. 
So what would Q prime of 16 be? Um, so it looks like something like that. You'll be able to see um, Q prime of 16 is just going to be evaluating the derivative at 16. So it's 6 times 16. So that's 60 plus 36. Uh, so what is that? 96, correct? Yes, I think that's right. Okay, so what do these things mean? Well, wait a minute. Let's go ahead and calculate um, the, the, the ratio. What's Q prime of 16 divided by Q of 16? So Q prime of 16 is 96. Q of 16 is 868. Um, so this is roughly what? Um, 96 divided by 868. Oh, about 0 0.11 in that neighborhood. Okay, so let's try to interpret. Q is the quantity. T is the time after um, year, uh, year since 2000. Uh, what do we got here? So it turns out that, well, this first Q of 16, that's how many tons um, um, of material is, um, is at the waste site, 868 tons of material at the waste site in the 16th year. Um, after 2000, so that's 2016. So in 2016, 800, the model predicts 868 tons of material. Um, and then Q prime of 16 is going to be the ratio of tons to, um, to year. So in, at, in the 16th year after 2000, 2016, the rate of change of the quantity of tons of material coming into the municipal site with respect to time is 96. So it's changing at a rate of 96 tons per year uh, at that uh, 20 in 2016. And then this last one is something your book spends a little bit of time on. I'm not going to emphasize it very uh, strongly, but it's neat because what it does is it gives you a ratio of um, how many tons per year um, divided by the number of tons that are actually present, right? Um, so this is would be a ratio of uh, 96 tons per year, um, and this is tons. So what is this really giving us? Um, it's giving us the rate or relative rate of change um, uh, of, 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 I guess, tons that are coming into the landfill um, in, uh, as, a, as a proportion of the number of tons that are actually there, right? So the relative rate of change gives you a sense of relative to how much is there, how fast is it, is it changing, and it turns out it's changing at about an 11% uh, per year um, at that 16th year. And of course, that'll be different for different years because the amount of tonnage at the, at the site is growing and the rate at which it's growing is changing. So, um, so the relative growth is something that's kind of interesting to look at. Here we have absolute growth um, for that particular year. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. And I will conclude our lecture there. I appreciate your, uh, your watching, and I, I wish you luck on your homework, and let me know if you have questions.